Dan and I talk about this a lot with you. It's like you like you'll find like diamonds and shit, like in a pile of turd. You'll find like diamonds in there. I'm like, how is Matt subdividing this property? And then it works out. Like, and I, I guess it took me some time to realize this, but you can be more creative with this. It's just having like more tools to the tool belt. Real estate's not like that creative. Right, like on the member success in the Discord channel, I remember you saying like, had a rough start the first six months, but then got through it, hit my first six figure month. And this was like in November. We're a week, two weeks into 2024. What are your goals for this year? I know you have big goals. What what do those look like? On the back of my phone, well, it's on the ground, so I can't show you, but I've had like $100,000 a month, like. So, uh, subconscious messaging. Yep. So a uh, million dollars a year is the goal overarching. But what's after a million dollars? What are you thinking? Like, you're not just going to stop there, right? Hey everyone. Welcome back to the real estate investing podcast. Today we have our host, Matt Pamphilis on here live in Tampa, Florida. And the topic today, we're going to talk about transitioning from wholesaling to land flipping. Matt, how are you doing today? Doing great. Nice to uh, meet you guys finally in person. It's good, man. Um, give us a brief update. We've interviewed you two or three times now, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think this is our third time. Third, yeah. Give us an update on what's going on since our last interview. Uh, last interview a couple months ago. Oh, where are we from? I think we had a couple subdivides going at the moment or at that time. Uh, we've since sold them. Mm -hmm. um, we got rid of a lot of our inventory that we had uh, from last year, um, trying to get more inventory in the pipeline. Uh, we're working on a few, uh, uh, one more subdivide, a few double close transactions. Um, actually, yeah, that's all, that's all we're working on right now. We're kind of slowly, but surely, um, starting to like work on doing our own deals, funding our own deals and implementing double closing, uh, just to kind of increase our profitability on mm -hmm. deals. But yeah, things are going well right now. Do you have any employees now? Um, we actually just onboarded a new VA this week. So uh, he's going to be responsible for like SMS management and doing preliminary market research uh, and other miscellaneous like data entry type things. Um, but I'm definitely looking to hire some more people this year, uh, looking to bring on like a transaction coordinator type role mm -hmm. to handle uh, like deliverables in a sense. You actually, I think, made a podcast on this the other mm -hmm. day and I was, yeah. Yeah, it was very impactful of like, a person who's responsible for uh, helping with our listings, putting deals uh, under contract with buyers and more so like a customer support role. Um, and then another hire that I want to make this year is going to be somebody who's responsible for our marketing uh, as it relates to like the data side of everything. So those are two hires that I want to make later in the year. But yeah, we've got a uh, virtual assistant who's full time right now, who's getting uh, trained up to be, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, we're, we're onboarding him this week. So very nice. You, you said subdivide. Are you getting more into it? Like what's, what's the deal with that? Uh, that particular deal was just a mailer that got returned and it was like a perfect subdivide fit. It's like buy for 61. And I think we're going to sell, I mean, we haven't closed yet, but uh, we're going to sell for around 140, I think. So with that particular deal, I actually am trying to pre-sell one of the lots so that I can close on this with my own funds, immediately resell the lot so that I can like reduce my cost basis to where I'm into the deal for only about like 10 to 15 K and then sell the other two lots because that will allow me to not have to take on a funder. So yeah, make up like end up making like 70, 80,000 instead of, um, you know, 40, 50. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's, I'm trying to do more subdivides for sure. But, um, yeah, yeah. And it's cool to see your journey there, but I want to bring everyone back if they haven't seen your first and second episode about your infill lot experience, because that's where you came from. You came from wholesaling infill lots, right? Yes. So let's talk about your experience with infill lots. And I want to focus on that for a little bit and kind of transition from there to uh, the rural vacant land like you're doing now and some of the differences. And I want to kind of touch base because flipping infill lots and wholesaling infill lots is much, much more popular than flipping vacant land, in my opinion. There's just more people doing it. It's more competitive in these markets. So I want to attack there. Like talk about your infill lot experience. Yeah. So uh, in order to kind of tell my journey, I need to go back a couple steps. So I was doing uh, single family wholesaling and then I was, um, I didn't properly plan my marketing that week and my VA needed more, uh, you know, marketing material. So I just pulled a list of vacant rural land in six counties. It was tax delinquent. Mm -hmm. We ended up pulling like six deals out of that list, which was a ton of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of dove deeper into infill lots as a business model. And 2022, we kind of honed the process and I did 39 deals, which uh, you know, it's a good amount of volume, but our average profit per deal was, I think, 4,500 and change. We have to do a lot more volume to make that make sense. But I mean, that, that worked out great, you know, doing infill lots. I had builders that I was working with. We had 
markets that we were, we were in that were pre-established. Uh, and then for me, at least interest rates rose and I just found it very challenging to continue doing deals. Mm -hmm. Like builders stopped buying, the prices decreased substantially. Uh, sellers still wanted, like they wanted more uh, for their asking prices. So I personally just found it very challenging to like continue to, to, to do deals. So I was looking for a new, um, you know, business model um, as I, you know, needed to make money. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have another job. So, you know, real estate was what I was doing. And then I transitioned into, like, I found your guys' course. Um, and I mean, it took me a while to get going. I got some deals quickly after starting, but, you know, my thought process was, okay, let's maximize the value on these deals. Like I'm, I'm looking at a, when I got these uh, three deals, uh, they were in, you know, Tennessee and, you know, we thought that we could sell it for X price. Uh, and I was like really married to that number um, because going from in film, infill lots, uh, the builders, they would usually like set a price that we, that they would be willing to pay. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was similar to with like retail buyers. Yeah. Um, and I was trying to pr uh, price it like a hundred percent of the market value, uh, which I think was, you know, not the right move. So I made a shift in the business where we would price lower, obviously to, you know, quickly sell deals, which I think you guys teach that as well. But I was kind of like married to the idea of trying to maximize our profit instead of like doing a higher volume of deals. So after we made that shift and started to get more marketing out, we started to get a lot more deal flow. And towards the end of the year, I mean, once everything was said and done, our average profit per deal this year was about like 25,000. Mm -hmm. So like almost four times or whatever that comes out to like four or five times higher awesome. than, uh, you know, infill lot. So With the same amount of work, less work, more work than the 4,500 profit. A different level of work, yeah. I would say like infill lots are easier because like if you, have, you know, a builder right here and you have a, uh, lined up right away. Yeah, you can line it up very yeah. quickly, get deals done in like under 30 days. Some of these deals, like the rural land deals, they take longer, mm -hmm. but like the profit makes it worth it. And if yeah. you just line up more at one time, you know, you can have several closings in a month where you can make, you know, 75, hundred K in a month, as opposed to like, if you tried to do that with infill lots, a lot it's of so parts it's, and pieces. Yeah. 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 Kind of reminds me of the, uh, desert squares that yep. everyone used to do back buy for 2000, sell for 6,000. And it, you could get such a high volume to, to make six figures. What do you need to do? You need to do like 50 deals, you know? 100%. So it just, it's a lot of moving parts and pieces for not that much. Yeah. I remember Matt, the consultation I had. So we do consultations obviously before we have members come in and you seemed hesitant. I think like what sold you on this business model? Cause I remember the consultation. I know exactly where I was in the consultation. I was walking around my basement, pacing back and forth, talking to you on the phone or whatever I was, but uh, what kind of sold you on this business model? Was it the, was it the margins, the potential, or were you just kind of moving away from something that you knew wasn't going to work long-term? Yeah, I think that I knew it wasn't going to work long-term and I wanted to create a more sustainable business. Um, it's also like you guys talk about this, like blue ocean mm -hmm. strategy, like I don't think that there's a lot of people doing this compared to infill lots. So like there is the aspect of like less competition being like an early adopter in yep. a sense. Mm -hmm. So that aspect of it, um, I think it's more scalable with like building a longer term business. Another thing is that, well, the reason that like I was sold on like making the transition was first off, I probably listened to 50 of your guys' podcasts before doing anything. Yep. And like, I've bought a lot of courses, so I feel like I can kind of differentiate between like good and bad products, if you will. So after having watched a lot of them, like having the call with you, I was already kind of wanting to move forward with this. Mm -hmm. um, but like another point of this business model that sold me, I guess, is that, and I, I guess it took me some time to realize this, but you can be more creative with this with Whereas with infill lots, there's one single exit strategy. Yeah, with what yeah. we're doing, there's several exit strategies. True. So like, okay, you can sell cash, you can sell like owner financing, you can subdivide, you know, you can do a lot of different things. You're doing all of right now. Yeah, yeah. So it's just having like more tools to the tool belt where, you know, we can be more creative. Real estate's not like that creative right. of mm -hmm. an industry unless like you're developing or doing some interesting project. But yeah. like this offers more creativity. Um, which I like. And it's not like you've been doing this a long time. Like, is it a year? Have you been doing this for a year? I think just over a year, just over yeah. a year. Like in this year, third time on the podcast, you're killing it. Um, what are your goals? Like going into 2024, what are you like? We're a week, two weeks into 2024. What are your goals for this year? I know you have big goals. What, what do those look like? Yeah. So the overarching goal is to hit a million in revenue, um, which on the back of my, on my phone's on the ground, so I can't show you, but I've had like a hundred thousand dollars a month, like 
so, uh, subconscious messaging. Yep. So we're going to, and really it's only $85,000 a month. So um, anyway, a million dollars a year is the goal overarching. Along with that, there's going to be some hires that I would like to make in order to delegate certain processes and, you know, other things I don't necessarily want to do. Like, like I said earlier, hire a transaction coordinator, uh, like a data person. Yeah. Um, and then I would also like to add in some uh, notes into my portfolio mm-hmm. this year, like five or six thousand dollars a month in in notes, just because you know, if we find a deal that has we can get into it for a very low, or if we can reduce our cost basis on certain deals that just come into the pipeline, that makes sense. Is you know, let's just buy this ourselves and resell it on financing. Um, you know, you can make a thousand bucks a month off of this deal. Right. I'm going to consider those um, instead of just flipping everything. So a million dollars a year or for this year, and then like five or 6,000 a month in uh, cash flow from notes. Yep. That's different. We don't hear that a lot with the cash flow. That's cool though. With the, the note cash flow, what, what's after a million dollars, what are you thinking? Like, you're not just going to stop there, right? No, definitely not. <laughs> I mean, we'll see. I think that again, this kind of comes back to the whole like scalability. And mm-hmm. if you think about like infill lots, it would be really hard to do a million dollars a year flipping infill lots. I think it'd be really hard not impossible. I think it's definitely possible if you incorporate deal funding, but I think it would be harder to do a million dollars a month with just this business model. So yeah. like implementing larger subdivide deals yep. and like what doing entitlements, yeah. like you need to do that in order to get like a million dollar profit per deal. Right. Um, I mean, there's obviously outliers to that, but like I've heard some crazy stories about people doing entitlement deals and making, you know, eight figures on deals. So I would like to get into that space. Um, so that's like, that's longer, longer term, uh, not really super well-defined goal yet. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. That's the cool thing about land is like, it's just, you say blue ocean and you, you, you said that this episode and it's just the opportunity. That's what I always tell people when you're coming in, like, yeah, we teach buying and flipping, buying as is flipping as is, but then you get into entitlements, subdividing and all these things that you can make six figures on an entitlement is tiny. Like seven figures is a very normal entitlement profit. Dan, from your perspective, like, because Matt's been in the program for a year, we're very close with him in terms of talking to him quite a bit. Like, what's separated Matt from the pack in terms of how he's taken on this program and where he is today? That's a really good question. I think just the aggressiveness of uh, you coming in, knowing what you want, knowing how to get there, following through with it, and not giving up. Because you said you had a slow start, like on the member success in the Discord channel. I remember you saying like had a rough start the first six months, but then got through it, hit my first six figure month, and this was like in November, right? Uh, I think it was we're, last month. We're December. Yeah. So you hit it. Uh, yeah. So, and you just put that in there. And I think that's the main thing is a lot of people come in, they're very shy. They're shy with their marketing, their mail, their texting. They're just really timid, I'd mm-hmm. say. And I think that's the difference. You are already doing this with info lots. You already knew real estate worked. A lot of people coming in aren't, don't have that, uh, proof of concept either yet. And Matt just was completely bought in, stuck with it. And you have such a growth mindset. Like before this, you were talking about Uh, traction, right? The book traction and implementing all those things. And when you're thinking like that and you have that mentality, of course, you're going to naturally scale. Like it goes with the, the bit, there's not a lot of people thinking like that. It's the 1% of the 1% essentially. It's always, you've always looked at it like a business and not like, maybe this is going to work. It's always like, I'm going to make this work. Uh, I guess I'm going to kind of ask that same question to you, Matt. Like, what do you think? You've seen people fail in this business, people not make it. You're, I, I don't think you'd call yourself the smartest person in the world or the top 1%. It's just what has separated you and made you successful in this business? Like what's the one, two, three things that you've done? Yeah, I would say like the you marketing You don't need to be aspect. humble either. No, I would say uh, <laughs> the marketing aspect for sure is like yeah. a, I feel like that's just something that's reiterated constantly of like getting marketing out there. But like it can be really hard to do that and like manage cash when you're starting out because it's like, okay, how do I, if there's like a couple slow months, like how do I maintain enough cash to like, you know, have this same amount of marketing go out every single month. So trying to like come up with a plan for marketing is a big uh, important thing. Um, and I feel like at starting a business, like having a high propensity to pain and like just being rejected all the time, that's an important thing. And then what would make me successful? I I would say like strong negotiating. Yeah. Like, I don't care if somebody's going to tell me no, like I I really don't care if I'm going to offend somebody with like an offer. Like I'll offer yeah. very, very low. And like, what are you going to do? Say no. It's like, Big deal. I don't care. Big like deal. We'll, right. we'll renegotiate from there. Um, so yeah, I think negotiating has helped like a lot on everything. Like I've, ne- I've negotiated like on every single property that we buy, mm-hmm. even if it's like a signed PA that comes back, like I'll look at it. I mean, not, that's not entirely true because I just accepted an offer that we locked up, but 
like being really good at negotiating, I think has helped me. Yeah. Um, the one damn that, uh, we, we gave Matt an assignment fee. I think it was, he's like, yeah, I'm under contract for 23,000. Can you give me $7,000 or something? I'm like, yeah, we'll, we'll match it at 30,000. We went back negotiating. He tried to negotiate with me. I won that negotiation, obviously. <laughs> um, but uh, then I looked at the PA later and like he talked to the guy down the 18. So he ended up making 13, $14,000 on the assignment, which is fine. Like we got the same deal and we bought yeah. that deal for 30 and sold it for 60. Did you know that we sold that one for 60? I think so. Yeah. That was a good I deal. ended up, I think I ended up negotiating down uh, I it made 10 15. on that. I made 10 on that. Yeah. But I mean, you made money, you negotiated. That's the, well, I tried to negotiate coaching, I think is what it was. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> try to get coaching. We, we couldn't overlap the two. Cause we, that's the investment business where we actually fund the deals. Yeah. And then the coaching's <laughs> like the educational and we try to keep those as, as separate as possible with that. But the worst thing you say is no. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's true. Dan and I, Dan and I talk about this a lot with you. It's like, you like, you'll find like diamonds and shit, like in a pile of turd, you'll find like diamonds in there. I'm like, how is Matt subdividing this property? And then it works out like that one triangle property. Like you just find diamonds in places that a lot of people wouldn't look like, or they're just not willing to negotiate whatever the situation is. And that's, I, I think it's made, made you such a good land investor. And I think it really will lead a good future. That, um, that property, the triangle one, yeah. I didn't even get that lead. That was like the neighbor's property who oh, was wow. like the nephew of the owner uh -huh. and like they own a ton of land in that area. So I was just like talking to it's him. It's a referral. Yeah, he owned, he's like a private equity guy and his wife or his wife's private equity and he's something in IT. So I was like, oh, this could be a funder. So I mm -hmm. just like had the conversation cause like who knows? And then his aunt sold me that property and I tried to buy his mom's property across the street. <laughs> that's, that's 50 wild. acres, that's, that's double-sided road good. frontage, but she signed a contract to like sell the timber. So unfortunately nice. that didn't work. I got a question for you. So you just hired another VA cause yours quit, right? Yeah. That's what you're saying? I showed Matt last week about the IQ on onlinejobs.ph, the IQ. Did you use that while hiring? Yeah, I think his is 125 too, but there has to be a discrepancy with 125 that. is common to see, It's right? so common. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how they like determine that, but yeah. it's, I guess, a good sign. So on onlinejobs.ph, where we hire a lot of our virtual assistants in the past, um, have had a really, really good success there. Matt and I met last week. We kind of went through everything, and I showed Matt the 100. The, they have an IQ score on the online jobs from the people that come and uh, are looking, are seeking for jobs. And it was just an interesting thing we talked about last week. It's kind of wild how they put that on there. We just had someone start yesterday and like the capability of them. It's, it's pretty cool. I don't know what you've seen so far with your, and just, it's a cheap, like what anyone. What are you paying can, yours? Uh, 525 an hour. But yeah. he negotiated. We talked about that too. He like, I, I sent him a low ball offer and he renegotiated, which was cool to see. Cause like yeah. he values himself. So I like that that. Same thing that with happened. ours. Yeah. Go Same on. thing with ours. But uh, yeah, don't miss a payday on them. They'll, they're, they're, they're they like, you. yeah, they, you can't miss paydays with them. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll get on you for like, did you send that? Did you send that? But uh, yeah, I mean the, the capabilities of what you can do. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. It's $5 an hour. What is that? 200 a week, 800 a month. And you can get a legitimate, wow. like added value to your company. And like we talked about in that episode last week, like take away low level tasks from your business. I think that's what you're kind of moving towards. Yeah. And my guy, he's got like 15 years of experience in real estate. I don't know how, like he has that much experience, but like, yeah, he's super high level. Yeah. That's um, cool. Which is cool. Yeah. So going from there, Matt, like you're trying to take on bigger deals. What's your strategy acquisition strategy? Like, is it, has it changed a little bit since you've like, you're, you're talking about hundred thousand a month this year. And I think you'll hit that pretty, like, I think based on where you're going, you'll hit that. But, um, what, what's your acquisition strategy changed or evolved over the year you've been with us? Yeah. So, um, in terms of like marketing, it hasn't really changed too much. I mean, I'm just, I'm getting more marketing out. So mm -hmm. our goal for this quarter is 22,500 for the quarter. So 7,500 a month in direct mail pieces along with SMS marketing. Um, I'll likely implement cold calling this, uh, this quarter or next quarter. My, my current VA, he wants to like build out that for me, which is he wants to build out a cold calling team for me. So that's pretty wow. cool. Yeah. He's like pretty excited <laughs> about it. I'm like, dude, let me onboard you first. And yeah. then we'll <laughs> talk about that. Curious to see how um, that one plans out. Yeah. Uh, and then, so not really anything different in terms of like what we're targeting. I'm trying to do bigger deals. Mm -hmm. So anywhere from like five, depending upon the County five to 10 as our, uh, like our acreage range to start all the way to a thousand. Like I'll always do a thousand cause I want to, you know, look at a assigned PA for 850 acres, which hopefully will happen yeah. sometime, you know, but yeah, something I'm doing now, which I'm kind of validating this as a feasible option, but putting a deal under contract and giving myself some more time, like 30 days due diligence, 60 days to close and trying to pre-sell the property. Yep. Um, because then I can just double close it 
and like not have to give, take a funder on it. Mm-hmm. So like with pricing accordingly, pricing competitively, we can, um, you know, sell the deal more quickly, uh, which, you know, I'm, I'm trying to decrease our average days in inventory as well, which is currently at like 128 days, uh, average days in inventory, which is in my opinion, too, too long. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to decrease that by pricing competitively and doing a double close, uh, transaction. So, I mean, that would be my biggest shift, which I'm really like just implementing now, but yeah, that's, that's, I would say our biggest shift. So what are your thoughts like on this business model as a whole? Cause we, we hear people all the time, like complain, like I had 3000 mailers not work. I didn't get a deal from 3000 mailers. And I had a coaching call with someone today. Like you're going to have months where you don't get a deal on five, 7,000 mailers. It happens. What are your thoughts on the business model as a whole going forward 2024 and beyond? I think it's going to still work for sure. I mean, I don't think it's real estate. Like people are always going to buy and sell real estate. I'm seeing a ton of people with, with cash right now, Mm -hmm. which is surprising. Like most of the deals that I've sold lately are all cash offers, which I love because you know, we make the most on it and it's the easiest to work with. Um, so I'm not really seeing anybody, any buyers pull out of the market from, you know, what we're doing, but I mean, there's still ways to sell deals. Like if you want to sell a property using owner financing, you can sell that note on the back end and still, you know, make money on the deal uh, in terms of like, flopped mailers. Like that's from what I'm seeing now, like trying to get more volume out. I'm not really even concerned with a single mailer. I just realized that over the course of, you know, three to six to nine months, it's going to average out to look at that coming in because you're trying to maximize your money as much as possible. But like, if you look at it more from a business standpoint of this is the total amount of money that I'm willing to risk or not risk, but like I'm willing to allocate towards this opportunity. It's like you can, have KPIs to like, see what the return on that money is. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, yeah, you're going to have flopped mailers. That's like always going to happen, but you know, just getting enough volume out there, you will get a deal that will, you know, pay for everything. Yeah. Pay for everything. Do you you think it's a mindset thing, Dan, as far as like, I don't know. Cause I, I, as far as like, you understand some people come in with five, $7,000 and it can go fast. Like that money can go away fast with mail. Mail's really expensive. Fast. Yeah. You need to take sales extremely seriously when you're in this business and you've done a good job of that, Matt. But what's your thoughts on that mindset as a whole, Dan? A lot of people, even experienced people like, okay, I had 3000 mailers not work. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's just not enough sample size really to look at anything. I don't think, but also you got to understand like I, I don't like to overanalyze, but also you got to make sure you're taking care of every lead because what's the cost of a lead at the end of the day, not a texting lead, an actual mail lead and a mail leads 200 bucks almost. Right. To, so you got to look at, and that's what we talked about earlier. Like Ron said, it's like you're finding diamonds in a piece of shit, right? You got to look at every single lead and take it very, very seriously. And I think a lot of the people who fail or have that mindset aren't the sales driven people and 3000 mailers at the end of the day, just isn't a big enough sample. It's just size not still. driven. It's people. not. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, you just need, you cannot take leads for granted. Like being an entrepreneur is not an easy thing. The aggressive people usually win. They're the ones who are And that's what, that's the consistency we see. They find ways to make deals happen yeah. instead of waiting for the deals. Like there's a time when you could just send 3000 mailers and you'll get two deals and it's just gonna, it's not gonna be like that all the time. Like some mailers are gonna be like that, but other times like you need to work to get deals. And if you take these calls for granted, I think that's when you really lose the, uh, you just, you're going to have failed mailers. And people look at the ratio rather than the ROI too much, I think also. Yeah. Because like if you send 5,000, 10,000 mailers, but you're getting a $100,000, uh, your, your average profit's $100,000, I'd take that all day. But all of a sudden, like Matt was saying earlier, his old uh, profit used to be 4,500. Then things, if you're taking two, yeah, 3,000 yeah. to get there. But obviously the ratio kind of balances out. But I look, you got to look at ROI on your mail spend and your advertising, marketing in general, rather than, the amount of letters it's taking to get a deal. I think that's the bit, one of the biggest things. How many deals did you do last year, Matt? Uh, I think we did like 12 deals and we did like 208,000 in uh, revenue from this business model. Uh, I had some other stuff closed yeah. in the beginning of this year. Uh, and I did a few single family deals last year, but um, yeah, I think it was nine deals that we had uh, that we got funding on. And I did a couple assignment deals, which I don't like, totally, uh, you know, encapsulate into all of our revenue, but yeah. based on the deals that we got funding on, I think our average profit was like 24,000. Yeah. So we did a low volume, honestly. And how much mail did you send? Do you know? I'd have to look at my, uh, maybe around like 35,000, which was honestly like so Matt, a lot. And that's a crazy thing, Dan. And that 200,000 Matt's talking about is not talking about mail 
is not talking about the deals that are closing this year as well, that he'll make money on that mail. Exactly. So he sent 35,000 mailers, $20,000 of expense, and he made $200,000. And that's, I was talking to someone earlier today, I told him, you sent, spend $20,000 on mail, you make 200 grand. You spend 10,000, you'll make 890 to 110. And it's just always 10 X's. And those are exactly Matt's numbers. He spent 20,000 and made 200 grand. And, and one thing you'll see when you scale too, the ratio is going to eventually, like when you start outsourcing salespeople, marketing data, you're not going to see as good as a ratio as you're getting now because you're doing the work, you're following up, you're yep. doing the acquisitions, you're doing everything. I feel like for a little bit longer, you're going to see a better and better ratio come. But eventually as you scale, like that number does have, um, it's kind of like ads in general, like the wider you go out, the worse of a return you see. And I feel like it's the same thing with this. When, once you start scaling and hiring. So I'm curious to see how that plans out as you hire your TCs and hire everything else when you're not in full control of every single aspect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think at scale, it, everything's gonna, but at scale, you're gonna make more money when you send more mail. It's just things will slip through the cracks. Um, it's just a matter, but I think Matt should be the person that's doing sales for his business for quite some time. Absolutely. Um, I don't have anything else though, Dan. Let's wrap it up there. Matt, thank you for joining today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Any last comments you got for the fellow land investors out there? Send your mail. Send, your mail. <laughs> Send like the that. mail. I like that. Well, as always, guys, thank you so much for joining today's podcast. Please like and subscribe our YouTube channel. It really helps drive our mission. Thank you for joining. We'll see you next episode. Thanks, guys. As always, thank you for joining. Please do us a huge favor and like and subscribe our YouTube channel and share this with a friend. It really means the world to Ron and I, but more importantly, it could help change the life of someone else. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you next episode.